Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Koken. We're taking a look at Chapter 2, Modeling Distributions of Data, and Section 1 is called Describing Location in a Distribution, and that's what we're going to be looking at first. You can see our objectives for this section are find and interpret the percentile of an individual value within a distribution of data. And this is basically what's going to drive what we're doing in this section. Where do I stand in the group? Estimate percentiles and individual values using a cumulative relative frequency graph. That's a new one that we haven't seen before. Find and interpret the standardized score, also called a z-score, of an individual value within a distribution of data. And then describe the effect of a linear transformation, adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing by a constant. What does it do to the shape, center, and spread of a distribution of data? Our vocabulary includes some of the things that I've just read about, percentile, cumulative, relative, frequency graphs. These are also called ogives. Position, z-scores, transforming data, density curves, normal, standard normal, the empirical rule, proportion, assessing normality. So there's a lot going in this chapter. This is a perfect chapter to follow our chapter one where we were looking at analyzing data. We're going to continue analyzing data with this example. So let's go ahead and get started. Here we have a set of data. 25 students in AP Statistics class got their grades on their first test. And we see that Jenny's score is highlighted in yellow. She got an 86. What we're interested in seeing is how did she do in comparison with her classmates. So what we're going to do, you can see that these numbers are not in order right now. We are going to put them, we're going to organize them into a stem plot. And one of the best ways to do this, we know that we can use our calculator all the time, put these numbers in the calculator so that you can put them in order and that will make it a little bit faster for when you create the stem plot. If you need help with that, ask in class. Let's go ahead and make that stem plot. Here's our stem and leaf plot, including our key, and we've highlighted Jenny's score of 86 again. Now, what we're interested in, remember, is how did she do in comparison with her classmates? And we can see it looks like she's in the upper half, so she's probably pretty pleased. What we're going to do, though, is we're going to measure a specific type of measurement, and that is called the percentile. The percentile is defined as the number of scores or the number of values in our data set to be more generic, but in our case, the number of scores below 86 or below what Jenny got over the total number of students who are in the class. So in Jenny's case, we're going to take a look and see what she scored. She scored 86, how many students scored below her, and we, we know that there were 25 students total. We're going to take Jenny out of that calculation, and then three students scored above her, so that leaves 21 who scored below her. So 21 students scored, scored below Jenny out of a total of 25 students. That means that Jenny scored in the 84th percentile. Sometimes there are people who define percentile as not in this, using this example, not only how many scored below Jenny, but including Jenny. So in that case, it would be possible to score at the 100th percentile, but in the way that we're going to be using percentile all year long and the way that you're expected to use it on your AP exam at the end of the year is only how many scored below. So that would not include Jenny in the calculation. What I'd like you to do now is pause the video and find the five number summary, the mean and the standard deviation of this data. The percentile that we, we calculated is consistent with our five number summary because she scored in the 84th percentile, which of course is between 75, 75th percentile and 100th percentile, meaning she's in that upper uh, quarter of the data. And we can see that with her 86 percent, she's between the Q3 and the maximum scores on the test. Just a reminder, I use the mu symbol and the sigma symbol for the mean and standard deviation because these are the scores of all 25 students in the AP Statistics class on their first test, so it represents the full population of students. Let's take a look at the formal definition of percentile. 
Here we have the formal definition of percentile. It says the pth percentile of a distribution is the value with p percent of observations less than it. So we're going to calculate it just the way that you saw on the previous page with Jenny's test score example. We're going to take a look at another example so that we can create a cumulative relative frequency graph. And for that, we're going to be looking at the ages of the 45 U.S. presidents at inauguration. The frequencies are already filled in, so we're going to fill in the rest of the chart. The frequency, or I should say the total frequency, we already said, was 45. So when we calculate the relative frequency, we're going to divide the frequency by 45. So you can see we've calculated 4.4%. <clears throat> Go ahead and stop the video and fill out the other relative frequencies and then turn the video back on. We've got all the relative frequencies figured out and unfortunately we do have a little bit of round off error because when we total them up we get 100.1%. We did use proper rounding rules though so we're going to go ahead and keep these as they are. Now let's talk about cumulative frequency. Cumulative frequency accumulates the frequencies. So we're going to start out with the first frequency that we have, 2, and then we're going to, with each different class or age group, we're going to add on the next frequency. So here we have 2 plus 7, 9, then we have 2 plus 7 plus 13, or 22, then we have 2 plus 7 plus 13 plus 12, which is going to give us 34, and so on, until we have all 45 presidents accounted for on the cumulative frequency column. The next thing we're going to do is find the relative frequency of the cumulative values. So for the first line, it's going to look exactly the same as the relative frequency line. But for all subsequent lines, it's going to divide the cumulative frequency by the total frequency. And I'd like you to pause the video and fill all of those out. Obviously, these should total up to 100%, but not need to add to 100%. Depending on which column we use, we can make a lot of different kinds of graph from this data, specifically histograms, relative frequency histograms, cumulative frequency histograms, and a new kind of graph that we haven't looked at before, which is a cumulative relative frequency graph, which is also known as an ogive. For the ogive, on the vertical axis, we're going to be going from 0 to 100%, and on the horizontal axis, we're going to have the age groups that we have in our data. Where we're going to graph everything on the horizontal axis is going to be based on the first value in the next group. So we're going to graph our 40 to 44 cumulative relative frequency at 45. So our first point is at 45 years of age and 4.4%. You can see where I've drawn it here. Also, we're going to need to extend the graph a little bit so that we can have a 75, which I've included as well. Go ahead and pause the video and graph the remainder of the points for our ogive. Once we got all of our points plotted, we're going to draw the segments between them. And to get us started, we are going to start a segment at zero, joining up to our very first point. So pause the video now and draw in the segments to join up the points. Now that we've got our ogive, we can do a lot of different things with it that are associated with percentile. So take, for example, we wanted to find the median age of presidents at inauguration. Let's just go to the 50th percentile and draw across to our ogive. It looks like our median age is just over 55, but not quite 56. Let's say we wanted to find our interquartile range. We go to the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. Just by the way, the way that we're doing this is we start out at the percentile that we want, like the 50th percentile, and draw straight over to the ogive and then drop 
straight down to the axis so that we can see what our age is. All right, on to the 75th percentile. We can see that the IQR is our 75th percentile, 60, minus our 25th percentile, 51. So it looks like our IQI is, R is 11 years. Now, we can go in the opposite direction as well. Let's say we wanted to know where um, a specific president stood. Let's say 64 years of age. So we start at 64 years of age, draw up to our curve, and then draw across to our percentile. And we would see that that falls in about the 85th percentile. Okay, that is the ogive, the cumulative relative frequency graph. The reason that this graph is so useful, once again, is it allows us to see where a specific data point falls in the distribution of data in terms of percentile, and it's great for comparison for that reason. This is not the first time that we've done comparisons, and we remember that our box plot is based on quartiles, and it also allows us to do comparative studies. That's because the percentiles and quartiles are very closely related. The five number summary and the box plot take all of the different pieces of data in our data set and they break them up into four quarters, while percentiles breaks it up into a hundred pieces. And, and we know that the first quartile corresponds to the 25th percentile, the second quartile corresponds to the 50th percentile, and the third quartile corresponds to the 75th percentile. I'd like for you to pause the video now and work on the check for understanding. Here you have it, you'll see it on page 89 of your textbook, but you've also got it here in your notes. So go ahead and work on it and then remember to check your answers in the back of your textbook in the solution section. Let's take another look at the test scores and Jenny's result of an 86. Looking at the mini tab summary statistics, we realize that Jenny has scored above average because the mean is 80, the median is 80, and of course she scored an 86. We also determined in the earlier exercise that Jenny scored in the 84th percentile. But we want to measure how Jenny did in yet another way, and that's going to be with a z-score. A z-score is something we haven't talked about before, but basically it's a unit of measurement that we're going to use, and it's a unit of measurement that measures in standard deviations. Z-scores tell us how far away an individual data point is away from the mean. It measures this distance in units of standard deviation, and it indicates direction below the mean with a negative number or above the mean with a positive number. Let's calculate Jenny's z-score compared to her peer group. So we're going to use the formula z is equal to the individual value minus the mean for the group divided by the standard deviation for the group. So the numerator gives the deviation and when we divide by the standard deviation, that tells us how many standard deviations away we are. For Jenny, this is going to look like the z-score is her individual value, 86, minus the mean, which we have in our mini-tab results, divided by the standard deviation of 6.07. This gives us a z-score of almost 1, and this means that Jenny scored almost one standard deviation above her peers. Let's try to find another z-score, and this time let's take a look at the person who scored a 75. Remember that the individual data comes first, so that's seven, score of 75 minus the mean, which is 80, and divided by the standard deviation, which was 6.07.
Give, this gives us a z-score of negative 0.824, and this means that the person who scored a 75 is about 0.8 standard deviations below the mean. Just one more thing about z-scores. This is also known as a standardized score. Okay. Here's our formal definition of z-score. We've got another check for understanding, so I'm going to ask you to pause the video, work on this, and turn it back on when you're ready to move on to the next page. Let's talk about transforming data. At different times, we have reasons for adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing data by a constant. Examples might be when changing units or when adding points to test scores to correct for an eliminated question. When we look at taking the original data and standardizing it or transforming it into a z-score, we see that there are two different operations going on. One of them is subtraction by the mean, and the other one is division by the standard deviation. Both of these transform the original data. We're going to take a look at what impact this has on the shape, center, and spread of the original data set. Let's explore this through an example. Soon after the metric system was introduced in Australia, a group of students was asked to guess the width of their classroom to the nearest meter. Here are their guesses in order from lowest to highest. And here is the dot plot and numerical summary of those guesses. Let's start by describing the shape, center, and spread of what we see. The first thing that we notice is that our distribution is very right skewed and bimodal. When it comes to center, we have both the mean and the median, so let's compare them. We see a mean guess of 16.02 meters and a median guess of 15 meters. Since we have a skewed distribution, the median is the more appropriate measurement to use. Again, we're given summary statistics, so when it comes to spread, we're going to report both the standard deviation and the IQR. Again, because of the skewed distribution, we're going to be using the IQR. Last of all, we need to check for outliers, and it looks like we might have a few. On the lower end of the data, we're going to do the Q1 minus 1.5 times IQR, that gives us a threshold of two. We do not have any data points that low, so we have no outliers on the low end. On the upper end, we're going to do Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR. That means that any values above 26 are going to be outliers. What we find is the four highest values in our data, 27, 35, 38, and 40, are all outliers. Now that we've had a little bit of a blast from the past analyzing the data as we did in chapter one, let's take a look at what transforming data will do. This data was all about the Australian students guessing the, the width of their classroom to the nearest meter. Turns out that the classroom was actually 13 meters wide. Whatever a student guessed, the distance from 13 is the error. Take out your calculator, and I would like for you to enter the data points for this data set. Then find your one variable statistics and compare with the mini tab output here. At that point, we're going to subtract from each of those guesses 13. So you'll put this data in list 1, and then in list 2, you'll do list 1 minus 13. Then run the one variable statistics again so you can compare then turn the video back on. Once we graph and run the one variable statistics, what we notice is that the shape has stayed exactly the same, except it has shifted to the left by, you guessed it, 13 meters. And what do we see in the mean? The mean is reduced by 13, but notice the standard deviation has no change. Now, all of the other values, including the median, have also shifted, but the IQR has stayed the same. Hmm, 
Wonder if we're going to come up with a rule for this one. Let's take a look at a different type of transformation. Now, this was one of subtracting 13. Addition and subtraction are basically the same operation, as you know, with just a positive number or a negative number. So you can assume that if we subtracted or if we added, we're going to see similar type behavior in the measures of center versus the measures of spread. Imagine that we want to report back to the students how close or how far away their estimates were. So we're going to take this new variable that we created, error, and we're going to convert the error for each student back to feet. We're going to need to use a conversion factor, and this is the conversion factor that we're going to use. So what I'd like for you to do is go back to your calculator and in list 3, you're going to define list 3 as list 2, the error in meters, times 3.28 to convert it into feet. And then run your one variable statistic again and then turn the video back on. The scale is a little different than our previous graphic, but you can see what happened. We have the original error, if you will, or the error that we had in meters in the top graphic and the error that we have in feet that we just converted in the bottom graphic. So what we notice is the overall shape hasn't changed, but the spread has changed significantly. And the data looks a lot more spread out than it originally did. Why? Because we multiplied. If we multiplied by a number larger than one, we would see it spread out. If we multiplied by a number smaller than one, we would see it compress. But either way, we see that the spread has significantly changed in our data as a result of this multiplication. The mean has also changed. The origin, and let's take a look at the one variable statistics now. We can see the one variable statistics for our error in meters and our error in feet. And we see that the mean has changed, the median has changed, but we also see that our measures of spread have changed. And of course, we could have predicted that because we saw how wide the data got in comparison to what it was before when it was in scale of meters. At this point, we really need to write down a general rule of thumb for us to remember when we're doing transformation or linear transformation of our data. When adding or subtracting a constant to each observation in our data, the measures of center, such as the mean or the median, will change by that constant. But the measures of spread, such as the standard deviation and the IQR and the range, will not change, nor will the shape change. When multiplying or dividing each observation by a constant, the measures of center and shape both change by a factor of that constant. We know that the overall shape will not change. It'll just become compressed or expanded, but we would still describe it the same way. All right, I think that does it for transforming data. So let's just recap on the z-scores for a second. When we convert our original observations to their standardized values or their z-scores, we are performing two linear transformations. The first one is a subtraction by the mean. The second one is the division by the standard deviation. So, so when we convert to standardized scores, what's going to happen to the mean and standard deviation and shape? Well, let's start with the easy one, shape. We know that that's not going to change. What happens to the mean when we convert all of the data to standardized scores? We know that the mean changes both by addition, subtraction, and multiplication, division. So the mean of the standardized distribution is going to have a mean of zero. We know that standard deviation is only affected by multiplication and division. So when we convert the standard deviation by our linear transformation of standardization, we divide the standard deviation by the standard deviation and we get one. So this means our z-score distribution is always going to have the same shape as the original data, is always going to have a mean of zero, and is always going to have a standard deviation of one. Now let's check our understanding. You're going to pause the video, work on this, 
And when you are done, check your answers in the back of the book and then move on to your practice problems, which is on your next page.